I'm going to introduce our first keynote speaker of the day, uh, Jean Leclerc. Uh, Jean has been a professor at uh, l'Université de Montréal since 1991. Uh, he is widely and prolifically published, recognized as one of the leading scholars on federalism in Canada. He, uh, in, nine, in 2013, uh, was awarded the Trudeau Foundation Fellowship for the quality of his research on federalism and specifically on constitutional rights of Aboriginal people in Canada. The focus of his work has been on reconfiguring political relations between Aboriginal people and governments and as well on the reconfiguration within Aboriginal communities. And I just wanted to read a little bit uh, from something Jean himself has said about constitutions. A constitution establishes the framework of a shared life project. Its legitimacy relies on the people's will to submit to the standards it advocates. As such, the law is sustained both by what a political community aspires to become and by the prosaic realities of its members. Unless we can establish the delicate balance between what we are and what we want to become, the legal order cannot elicit the allegiance of the people who are subject to it. So um, now, the, just in closing, just to say about Jean, another thing he has said about himself, which I hope is true today, is that uh, he is someone whose purpose is to expound on the complexity of a given reality and contribute to its intelligibility. We look forward to hearing from you, uh, Jean, and the title of his talk is the story of constitutions, constitutionalism, and reconciliation, a work of prose and or poetry. Jean. Hi. Uh, dans, dans un premier temps, je, je remercie la bande Cree Enoch uh, de nous accueillir sur son territoire. And uh, I also thank the elder for his uh, very wise words. And I'm not just saying that out of, out of politeness. There's a great depth in what he said, and I believe in what he said. Um, finally, I thank the organizers for the privilege they have bestowed upon me in asking me to deliver one of the conference's keynote addresses. I'm thinking of Patricia in particular. And it's a great responsibility. And uh, I hope not to disappoint anyone. <clears throat> Reconciliation is a profoundly political matter, and politics having to do with power, so does true reconciliation. First, it has to do with how power is constituted, that is, set up. Or in the famous words of Harold Laswell, who gets what, when, how. Second, inasmuch as reconciliation is generally associated with claims of greater, for greater participation in a state's political arrangements, or for greater autonomy within the state. It raises the question of how the power of dominant political, social political elites, I use the word in a neutral as opposed to a praising manner, can be limited. Now, those are precisely the questions that constitutions and constitutionalism have been designed to address. The study of constitutions, that is the business of constituting power, has a very long history. In the non-indigenous universe, constitutionalism, however, understood as legally limited government, is the rather recent byproduct of the historical evolution of some polities. A great variety of normative conceptions of constitutionalism have been proposed in order to mend Canada's broken relationship with Turtle Island's indigenous peoples. In other words, these normative conceptions of constitutionalism form the cornerstone of reconciliation. Many are rooted in deeply aspirational perspectives orbiting around the idea of dialogical consensus, according to which if we could collectively construct a new vocabulary and a more embracing kind of shared understandings, a new form of const constitutionalism would eventually blossom. I call this constitutional idealism or poetic constitutionalism, because it is not so much concerned with constitutionalism and democracy as forms of government, that is, as means of organizing power, as it is with constitutionalism and democracy as values, 
that is, broadly speaking, their relation to the good. Some dismiss such normative approaches by claiming a more realist conception of constitutionalism. They argue that if looked at from a bottom-up perspective rather than the top-down perspective of normativists, constitutionalism is a form of government uh, as a form of government has only allowed for legally limited government when and where it served the dominant political elites. I call this constitutional, constitutional realism or prosaic constitutionalism because it generally explains the advent of legally limited government, constitutionalism, as the product of compromise measures unsupported by aspirational principles adopted by dominant political elites in order to reinforce rather than limit their own power. My claim is that both the poets and the prosaists are partly right. In what follows, I will argue that although fragile and, irre and reversible, a form of imperfect, diffuse, and reflexive constitutionalism has grown out of Canada's non-Indigenous constitution and tradition, one that under certain circumstances and conditions has the potential of helping Indigenous peoples obtain greater self-governing powers than our constitutional structure now allows for. I refer to Canada's non-Indigenous constitutional tradition because, as I will endeavor to demonstrate, I agree with the realists when they imply that if reconciliation is to happen, it will have to happen within the larger realm of the dominant Western-based notion of constitutionalism. As beautiful as Indigenous constitutionalism might be, it will not, in and of itself, by the simple force of its appeal, transform the dominant understanding of constitutionalism. However, I believe that the realists downplay the importance of normative discourses in the mobilization of the political forces that have slowly, painfully, and not yet completely pried open the realm of the dominant political elites. And as I will argue, normative discourses mobilized nowadays in the quest for reconciliation and for greater autonomy for indigenous polities can certainly and must certainly themselves be influenced by nor indigenous normative understandings that would benefit us all. What I assert in short is that our understanding of constitutionalism must conjugate rather than separate constitutionalism as a value, that is, what it is from the point of view of the ethical and the desirable, in what way is it related to ideas of democracy, liberty, and equality? And constitutionalism as a form of government. How did legally limited government come to be historically? How is it operationalized and institutionalized in this messy world of ours where power is unevenly distributed? To understand my argument, some of the basic premises of Western-based constitutionalism must be described. Some of these premises are irreconcilable with many indigenous constitutional tenets based on the idea that in pre-colonial times, authority was diffuse and persuasive, not centralized and coercive. In other words, power understood as the capacity to make others act against their personal interests appears to have been unknown in pre-Columbian times. Consensus seeking and willing deference being the sole means of exerting authority. The constitutionalism of which I will speak is not strictly understood as limited government through dialogue and consensus, but rather as the pursuit of limited government in contexts where consensus is precisely not always possible or is simply unattainable. Contemporary Western-based constitutionalism is premised on the following ideas. There are more, but these are the ones I want to insist upon. <clears throat> First, individuals certainly have the potential to be good, but as James Madison and Alexander Hamilton put it, quote, there is a degree of depravity in mankind which requires a certain degree of circumspection and distrust, unquote. Two, power within large polities has always, is always, and will always be unequally unequally divided. Three, 
Because of radical transformations of the social and political orders during the 18th century, the state's legitimacy is no longer thought to be derived from a transcendental or traditional source, but from the imminent power of the people. However, in large polities, democracy does not mean that power is exercised by the people. Rather, it refers very generally to a method of group decision making characterized by a kind of equality among the participants at an essential stage of the collective decision making. And this is so because, for power in large polities has always, is always, and will always be exercised by the few and not the many. This is what I call the oligarchic fact of politics. The 18th century revolutions did not change that reality. Finally, the Western constitutionalism tradition came to life not because it embraced what Filippo Buonarroti famously described in 1828 as the order of equality, but on the contrary, because it harnessed itself, at least in part, on the order of egoism. That is, in the words of Buonarroti, a system where the spring to sentiments and aspirations is the selfish one of mere personal interest without any regard whatever to the general good. A more generous, and I believe more accurate, description was given by French Benjamin Constant, who argued in 1819 that because of the intellectual and political upheavals of the 18th century, the liberty of the moderns had displaced the liberty of the ancients. The aim of the moderns, he said, is the enjoyment of security in private pleasures, and they call liberty the guarantees accorded by institutions to these pleasures. Whereas for the ancients, the Greeks for instance, liberty consisted in exercising collectively and directly several parts of the complete sovereignty. But Constant stresses, if this was what the ancients called liberty, they admitted as compatible with this collective freedom the complete subjection of the individual to the authority of the community. In other words, Western constitutionalism and democracy rose out of a wish to reconcile the desire for collective freedom with the enjoyment of private pleasure. One might ask, one might ask how democratic institutions could have grown out of such uninviting grounds. How could normative discourses about democracy and equality even emerge, let alone influence such an apparently dystopian universe? Be that as it may, however imperfect and however incomplete they might be, democratic institutions and limited government did grow out of Western civilization's tormented historical trajectory. Why? First, let's recall why political communities chose to adopt constitutions, which for the most part were unwritten until the end of the 18th century they mostly chose to adopt binding rules to make collective action more efficient so, to, so as to ensure their collective survival. They therefore set up power in order to better the, defend themselves against their foes. This, uh, this appears to be just true just as much in the case of indigenous peoples. When the great Odinoshone peacemaker, the Ganawida, planted the tree of great peace, or tree of the great long leaves. An eagle was placed atop it, invested with the task of warning the people of the league if it saw any danger threatening in the distance. One of Diganawida's arguments to convince the members of the league to unite in a confederacy was to take out an arrow and split it easily in two, and then bring out five arrows and show how much more difficult it was to break them. In non-indigenous indigenous contexts, War, and therefore revenue seeking to make war possible, has always played a role in the advent of constitutions, their evolution, and their overthrow. And this is not confined to the West, but extends to Asia and the great empires of Africa and Mesoamerica. These phenomena are also entwined with the eventual growth of limited government. Constitutionalism in the West came about with the advent of the state as we know it today. War, economic transitions, the rise of trade and ideology all played a role in this complicated history. 
Bluntly put, in the words of Stephen Holmes, prosaic constitutionalists, as he is himself, argue that, quote, the most democratic reason why elites have proved willing to impose limits on themselves is that such limit help to mobilize the voluntary cooperation of non-elites in the pursuit of the elite's most highly prized objectives, especially revenue extraction and victory in war, but also information gathering and the timely correction of potentially fatal errors of judgment. Holmes continues, full-fledged democracy has always been and will always remain more an aspiration than a reality. But genuinely democratic episode occur when powerful actors discover, as they sometimes do, a palpable advantage in popular participation, government transparency, protection for minorities, and uncensored debates." Unquote. In short, constitutionalism was the product of the following paradox. Limited power generates more power. For instance, the English Parliament was born not as the result of a spontaneous self-realization of the order of equality, but out of an act of royal will. The order, uh, Parliament was created because it served the king's interests. In the 16th century, the English Parliament did not suffer the fate of its con con continental counterparts because it assisted rather than opposed Henry VIII in his quest to undo the medieval privileges constraining the exercise of his royal power, authority. Parliament also proved essential in the financing of the ever more expensive wars in which the king was embroiled. Kings realized that allowing a measure of political representation in Parliament through those who produced wealth was an astute political investment, much more efficient than predation. By protecting the interests of the wealth producers and letting them have a say in the political arena, kings were able, in exchange, to obtain the producer's consent to the taxation that generated the revenue stream they needed to consolidate their, pow consolidate their power. The paradox, according to which limited power generates more power, also explains why in June 1755, Chief Justice Belcher of Nova Scotia found no difficulty in declaring perfectly legal the deportation of thousands of Acadians, whereas both James Murray and Guy Carleton refused to implement the Royal Proclamation of 1763, requiring them to introduce the entirety of English law in the province of Quebec. Friedrich Haldeman, would later be severely reprimanded by London for having disobeyed the secret instructions ordering him to give the most restrictive interpretation possible to the Quebec Act. In the case of the Acadians' deportations, since troops were available to handle the job and the British fleet was in Halifax Harbor, there was no need to concede anything to limit one's power. However, in the province of Quebec, about 65,000 French-speaking Catholic Canadiens coexisted for many years with approximately 2,000 Protestant old subjects, as they were called. Military considerations, not least of which were the revolutionary convulsions slowly bubbling up to the surface in the 13 colonies, made concession to what London believed to be the conquered dominant social elites, the seigneurs and the clergy, absolutely essential. The tithe and the coutume de Paris, which respectively were the legal basis of the clergies and of the seigneurs' access to revenue, were therefore reintroduced by the Quebec Act. Hence, there is some undeniable truth in the realists' depiction of the advent of constitutionalism as the realization by dominant political elites that limits to their own power help them in mobilizing the voluntary cooperation of non-elites in the pursuit of their most highly prized objectives, especially revenue extraction and a victory in war. However, the story of constitutionalism is one that intermingles human purposes aimed at this or that result, the wish of the rulers to remain in power and gain revenue, and the mostly unintended consequences of human actions actually taken to fulfill 
these purposes. In other words, brute power might unknowingly be the source of limited power. And it might be the triggering device for the advent of new and powerful normative discourses about limited government, democracy, liberty, and equality. For instance, even though the English king's purpose in allowing parliament to endure was only aimed at securing greater revenue, the unintended consequences from flowing from this decision was a transformation of the institution of parliament itself over time and the rise of new normative discourses about sovereignty, democracy, equality, and liberty. It even led to the decapitation of the ruler himself at the hands of parliamentarians. My point here is to stress that although the purpose of kings might have been devoid of principle, the consequence of their actions was the establishment of an institution, parliament, that eventually claimed more and more power for itself. And it did so, not simply by force of arms, but by harnessing its demand to powerful new normative discourses, claiming that sovereignty no longer stemmed from a heteronymous source, but from the people itself. In turn, this discourse would provide the basis for further political collective action initiated by the non-elites still excluded from the, the prevailing definitions of the people. And this would lead to more institutional changes, the extension of the franchise, for example. Constitutionalism as a value and constitutionalism as a form of government, therefore actually reinforce one another in a diffuse and reflexive manner. The history of Canada's evolution prior to 1867 provides another good example of the interplay of these two facets of constitutionalism. It is true that the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and even imperial statutes, think of the Union Act of 1840, were often used to deny any collective freedom to the Canadiens. It is equally true that, as I explained, the concessions made by London were inspired by a desire to co-opt the conquered elites in order to better maintain the metropole's hold on the colony. But it is equally true that some among the discarded social elites of the Canadiens discovered some unknown normative treasures inherent in the British legal tradition the right to petition, the right to be secure in their seigneurial property, and the right to seek representative institutions and even eventually responsible government. All things unknown under, in New France and even England, and in France in the 18th century. When read, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, at the time, when reading the works of my colleague Michel Morin and of historian of ideas Yvan Lamonde, one realizes that the Canadiens cunningly constructed a normative discourse inspired by the tenets of the British Constitution to secure rights granted to old subjects. In doing so, they were piggybacking on the victories obtained by the British themselves after their civil war. The British Constitution helped these Canadian non-elites with the help of the non-elites of British stock to build the political capital needed to advance their cause and to secure representative governments and eventually responsible government. Let us not exaggerate. If circumstances had been different, the Canadiens might have suffered the fate of the Acadians, or a less dismal one, that of the French inhabitants of Grenada, the other French colony subjected to the Royal Proclamation of 1763. And even if they have not suffered that fate, their gains were the result of a hard struggle during which the first reflex of the British authorities was always to systematically deny to the Canadiens the democracy they boasted they had established in 1688. After describing what democracy meant in the province of Quebec of Canada prior to 1867, Yvon Lamont himself concludes that it was, quote, a democracy based on the power of the stronger, the colonizer, unquote. This might be so. However, by mixing political action, strategic alliances, and normative discourse about equality and liberty, the Canadian elite helped bring about a political reconciliation in the form of limited autonomy within a federal regime in 1867. Even though some might radically disagree with me, my colleague Gislain, for instance, it seems that the federal solution achieved in 1867 
modified by further struggles that led to changes to the material, although not to the formal constitution, still succeeds in preventing a large majority of Quebecers from wishing a complete exit from the Canadian constitutional fold. After 1867, more and more non-elite groups conscripted the normative vocabulary of democracy, equality, and liberty, think of women, to claim their share in the exercise of political power. This was not the result of a well-thought-out plan or a mystically propelled evolution, but rather the result of a diffused constitutionalism, where the latter is in part the result of the unintended consequences of human actions that are not necessarily designed to do good. In fact, we could call this trickster constitutionalism. If power wielders did make concessions to a growing number of people over time, it is also because every victory made in the name of equality prepared the terrain for the next one. And it was difficult to deny to newcomers on the political field what had been granted to their predecessors. As more non-elites gradually got to participate in the exercise of political power, new normative discourses were generated, promoting the creation of new types of shared understandings concerning political arrangements. These new beliefs, in their turn, fed into the political struggles, leading to new transformations of our democratic form of governance, hence my use of the qualifiers diffuse and reflexive constitutionalism. What lessons can be learned from this where indigenous peoples are concerned? First, I believe that Stephen Holmes is right when he claims that, quote, if you wish a constitutional norm to govern the way politician, politicians behave, you need to organize politically to give ruling groups an incentive to pay attention and accept the restraints on their own discretion for their benefit and yours, unquote. One reason for the Cree's success at negotiating the James Bay Agreement and the Paix des Braves was their ability to remain united. Their political acumen during the Paix des Braves negotiations, they played the PQ government like a master violinist plays his instrument and their masterful use of normative discourses on the international claim as a means to pressure the dominant political elites. But they also succeeded in convincing those elites that true political autonomy for them might mean better policies for their people and hence less responsibility for the Quebec and federal governments and maybe, just maybe, less resentment towards them by the Cree people. Building the political clout necessary to give ruling groups an incentive to pay attention is a difficult task for indigenous peoples, since they, make on, they only make up a little more than 4% of the population, and they do not all sit on billions of dollars of hydroelectricity. However, as indigenous peoples, they benefit from an ever-growing capital of sympathy that provides them with considerable power. These last years, Many Canadians woke up to the atrocious reality of residential schools and are more aware of the manner in which Canada's indigenous collective and individual lives were crushed during the last 200 years and how indigenous peoples are still suffering from the aftershock of the cultural genocide that took place during the 20th century. The urban-based, women-initiated Idle No More movement has also demonstrated the vibrancy of the modern indigenous civil society and its determination to be heard. In addition, legal instruments such as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples serve as powerful levers in the indigenous people's political struggle for greater autonomy. More and more extractive project proponents realize the financial and reputational benefits they could garner from supporting a free prior and informed consent regime in Canada and elsewhere. Finally, the Supreme Court is getting more and more entangled in its own conceptual nets. By recognizing Aboriginal rights and titles as collective rights, allowing their bearers to take decisions as to who gets what, when, how, it is bound to eventually recognize a generic right to self-government to indigenous, indigenous communities over their internal affairs. It is in this context that normative discourses stand a chance of influencing the evolution of Canadian constitutionalism. They can provide the ideas necessary to make mobilization possible. Once they permeate the public discourse, 
They become powerful tools in the indigenous people's political struggle for greater autonomy. And it is my claim that normative discourses mobilized in the quest for reconciliation and greater autonomy for indigenous polities can certainly themselves be influenced by indigenous normative understandings that would benefit us all. Normative understandings such as the need to set up power in a less anthropocentric manner so that our interconnectedness with other living beings be truly acknowledged. However, these normative discourses about reconciliation to better convince the dominant political elites that it is to everyone's advantage that indigenous people be recognized greater autonomy, for these normative discourse to do so, they must address constitutionalism not just as a value, but as a form of government. And not just as a form of government from the state's perspective, but as a form of government for contemporary indigenous communities themselves. Many indigenous and non-indigenous persons, intellectuals, are doing just that. I'm thinking, for instance, of the extensive literature written about the fundamental role played by treaties in Canada's constitutional tradition. I have in mind John Burroughs, Val Napoleon, and Hadley Friedland, uh, and many others who search for means of revitalizing indigenous legal traditions, and in doing so, reveal their relevance for solving contemporary problems, real problems, real life problems, not just ethereal ones. I'm also thinking of the self-described white settler Emily Snyder, whose work in cooperation with John and Val on violence against indigenous women focuses on indigenous ways of tackling these issue, this issue. I have in mind UVic's proposed joint degree in Canadian common law and indigenous legal orders. I'm also thinking of initiatives such as the Ganawage community decision-making process developed under the aegis of the Ganawage Legislative Coordinating Commission in 2005. This initiative might not have bred all the success as hoped for, but it was a courageous attempt at revitalizing traditional forms of governments, governance. There will be failures, but there will be successes. But we have to accept the failures if we want to get successes. All these initiatives are more than just assertions of the indigenous people's right to self-government, but demonstrations of their capacity to address the challenge, sometimes with very limited resources, of actually exercising that right. All these initiatives and similar ones in Quebec indirectly and directly played a part, for instance, in the adoption last August of Section 543.1 of the Civil Code of Quebec, which states that conditions of adoption under any Quebec Aboriginal custom may be substituted for conditions prescribed by law. This small opening by the state, Quebec state apparatus might bring forth unexpected results. As such, it is an encouragement for those nations who wish to do so to address the task of identifying their own customary adoption rules. But more importantly, it might also constitute an incentive to extend those inquiries to fields other than adoption. This is how constitutionalism operates in a diffuse and reflexive fashion. It was and still remains a struggle between the values and ideals it embodies and the forms of government that instantiate them. No doubt, the latter always fails to meet the standard fixed by the former. However, in this constant struggle, the ideal feeds the real and the real the ideal, in the sense that normative discourses provide the ideas around which non-elites can ally themselves to one another and to willing members of the elite so as to exert on dominant political elites the pressure required for something like reconciliation to happen. This might, sign, this might sound like a depressing conclusion. And in some ways, it is, especially for those who legitimately outraged by the snail-paced process of change, seek the immediate fulfillment of their desire to obtain as much auton autonomy as possible. The thoughts expressed here might sound equally irrelevant to those who think that there is nothing to learn from the Western tradition. However, the West, whatever that word encompasses today, by the way, is too often depicted as a monolithic block that sprung out fully armed, like Athena from Zeus's head, 
with the sole mission of crushing the rest of the world under its heel. That is certainly a part of Western history, but not the whole of it. I thought it would be worthwhile to underline that the Western constitutional tradition itself was born out of the struggle of generation of European non-elites, including a lot of women, who shed rivers of blood to achieve the imperfect form of limited government that is now ours. In other words, not everyone is all powerful in the Western world. There are alliances to be made between indigenous peoples and other Canadians who seek a world where being is of more import than having. These alliances are worth nurturing if we wish to learn from one another and achieve reconciliation. One last word. Anyone, be they indigenous or non-indigenous, who witnesses what is happening today in the USA or in Turkey should think twice before wishing the Western constitutional tradition away. Hi, hi. Merci beaucoup. Well, now that was a dose of reality to begin the day with. Um, so we are a little bit behind time. Uh, could we maybe have two questions? And then uh, could I ask our panelists to start preparing themselves for the next panel uh, in the meantime? So are there questions? And Dejan, I'll just let you take the questions. Mais on a seulement le temps pour deux questions. Ils peuvent te parler pendant le dîner. Just a quick question, sir. Um, just lately there's been, you know, I mean, of course, the introduction of the Indian Act to our peoples was probably the greatest, you know, mass destruction ever. But then, then again, they did that all over the world, so I guess we weren't spared. But, you know, the patriarchal regimes that dominate the matriarchal societies that we've come from, that we represent. And lately, there's been some discussion about doing away with the Indian Act. And what then? And I'd like your opinion on that. Thank you. Well, the most intelligent thing I can say about such a complex issue is that I'm not going to be the one to inform you that indigenous peoples are very different. They, they're not, they have common uh, problems, but they face different issues. They have different cultural backgrounds. And so I think that uh, some will be capable of negotiating treaties because they have the, the, the power levers to do so. Others might still need the help uh, of, um, of governments because they would like that to happen. I was mentioning yesterday on the microphone that some of the other indigenous, uh, indigenous groups in Canada might like a federal statute providing for some space uh, to self-govern. Um, so I think that the options are open. M my belief, because I'm, a, I'm as Thomas King, the great indigenous writer, I'm a hopeful pessimist. And um, so I think that there is a change in the mindset of Canadians that makes going back impossible. Now, uh, I agree with uh, a lot of people that doing away with the Indian Act in, in one fell swoop would not be the, the solution because as terrible as it is, it provides a space for indigenous communities to be together. And so we, went, we have to work from there. Because I also work from a premise of what I call minimal anthropology, is that I don't think that individuals such as me are either superhumans that can change within a day and leave behind the, the, the influences they, 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 they felt. But then again, I also believe that this being true, we're not superhumans, but given the chance, we can do some small things. And I was, I was uh, reading Hadley's little book that was made with the students. I think that's a, a wonderful step. There's a kid in there who says, I'm happy. He's a young boy of, of, of 12, and he says, I'm happy to have people who never came to my reserve and see me treat the height of, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the moose with my, my grandma. And I think that's a start. So 
But I don't have uh, an answer for, for uh, uh, I think we have, st we have to, I have to take steps in my own classroom. Uh, and um, my understanding of law is not a top-down thing. My understanding of law is that here, in this room, if we stop, uh, if we don't stop at the stop sign, the law can ask you to stop at the stop. It doesn't work. We have to be willingly behind the norms that we, we prefer and we prefer. <laughs> and um, that's the most uh, I can say. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much for listening.